Yes, and welcome. It is such a glorious season. The daffodils are finally blossoming, which means it's finally time. The soil is freshly warm enough that we can sow beta vulgaris, beets and shard, also some other fun things. Let's talk. And welcome to Fruition Seeds. And this evening we are diving into beets and five seeds to sow in spring. Spring has sprung and sending love from our garden to yours. And without further ado, I would love, love, love if you would tuck your name in the chat. Go ahead and share your name, where you're calling in from, the name that oh, we I know, try, as you well can't as hear it, but then I realize the name of the place that you occupy. And I would love also to know your favorite beet recipe. <laughs> Not necessarily every spoonful, tablespoon of oregano and salt, but do you love pickled beets? Are you down to make beet kraut? Do you love to roast them? What is your favorite beet recipe, friends? I can't wait to hear, and I'm already hungry for the beet potluck, which I hope one day we all will share. So now, without further ado, thank you, Kira. Thank you for sharing your joy of language justice with us tonight with ASL interpretation. Thank you also to my beloved partner, Matthew, who is hanging out in the chat. So he is so, Martina, I love pickled beets too. <laughs> or I'm not Polish. And Matthew is up in the chat. So he is there to accompany you with any questions you may have, whether it's a quick clarifying question, whether it's a big existential question. Matthew is a marvelous human to accompany us all with all of these questions and quandaries in the garden and beyond. I'd also love to thank our Fruition crew. There are freshly a dozen of us full-time at Fruition Seeds now. <laughs> it is a phenomenal community of Hey folks. Petra, I'm going to cut you off real quick. Yeah. Kara, can you turn on the... Um, oh, it is on. Somebody was asking about the auto transcript. So if you're looking for the auto transcript, it's down in the bottom of your screen where it says live transcript. So please click on that and you can see the live transcript. Carry on. Thank you for asking and thank you, Matthew. What a fabulous PSA. <laughs> and I'd also love to thank the plants and humans, our ancestors both and all who have co-adapted across millennia to make it possible for us to share beets and seeds and stories and grow together tonight. So without further ado, now let's have a quote. I love to begin all of these series with a quote, song, story, poem, and tonight some words from Margaret Mead adapted here at Fruition Seeds. So yes, Margaret Mead has become rather famous for saying, never doubt that a small committed group of humans can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I would just add to that tonight, change the world, grow beets. These things aren't easy <laughs> and we can do these things so much better together. I am so here for you, friends. So I'm delighted to share with you just really quickly the five other seeds besides beets, the five other roots that you can sow right now in late spring that will surround you with abundance all season long. And then we'll talk history, the history of beet, which is exceptionally fascinating. We all have Napoleon to thank for something. Who knew? <laughs> Apparently beets are one of them. Then we'll talk about the types of beets. We'll also talk about garden planning and beets. And we'll talk about sowing beets. There's so much to share. And we are also talking about transplanting. If you want to know about transplanting beets, we'll talk more and we'll give you the details. And then we'll talk about thinning and we'll talk feeding containers, insects, diseases. We'll talk about harvesting beets, storing them, season extension, and we'll end with the common mistakes that people make so that you don't have to make them. So yes, without further ado, let's dive right in. What are those five other seeds besides beets that you can sow 
right now. So you can sow radish, of course. Salad radishes, not watermelon radish. Watermelon radish is a fall radish. So you want to sow those about two months before final frost. So much more to share there. But yes, small salad style radishes, perfect to sow now. Also salad turnips. I love turnips so much. Carrots, we're about to sow ours. In a couple of weeks, we'll let the soil get a little bit warmer, but if you really want to, you could totally sow them now here in zone five. And parsnips are also great to sow now. And finally, those fabulous potatoes, tubers. Okay, they're not exactly roots, they have roots. Potatoes are tubers, it's true. Um, but there you have five, five roots that are perfect to sow now and in the very, very nearest of futures. So now let's talk about beets and history. So beets, as we know them, we kind of have a lot of people to thank and Napoleon is really high at the top of the list. So beets are beta vulgaris, they're genus species, and beta vulgaris is the same species genus species of Swiss chard. So Swiss chard and beets share the same common ancestor that has evolved millions of years along the Mediterranean. So it loves, loves, loves to grow even in a slightly salty environment and certainly temperate and even cool, it has adapted well over time. But 4,000 years ago, people started actively domesticating beta vulgaris and largely just in the Swiss chard department, right, growing those delectable leaves. Um, but it was about 2,000 years ago that people started active, actively selecting for those swollen beet roots. And before they were eating them, they were actually using them as a dye, which is just, I love thinking about. So at, prior, to, prior to being a table beet, beet roots were just as a dye plant. And then 500 years ago, these large fibrous roots that were super starchy and not at all tender like we think of them now, were being grown, especially in Eastern and Northern Europe, mangle wurzels <laughs> as fodder for animals to enjoy all winter long. And people would eat them too. They were quite sweet, but they were also quite fibrous. So in the mid 1700s, a German chemist named Andreas Margoff, <laughs> he discovered that the sucrose, the sugar in beets is identical molecularly to cane sugar. And so he predicted that there might be a day that cane sugar um, might actually have a competitor in the sweetness marketplace of beets. And he wasn't wrong. 50 years later, one of his students, in fact, built a small sugar beet factory in what we now call Poland and started to experiment with this. And Napoleon, just over his shoulder, was taking note. And Napoleon, among other things, thought it was just outrageous how expensive expensive cane sugar was coming through England exclusively through the West Indies and he just didn't want to be reliant on the English for anything much less his sweets. So Napoleon kind of single-handedly invested between 1810 and 1815 ludicrous quantities of dollars. I confess I haven't done the math to figure out how what it translates to in like American currency, but let's put it this way, 79,000 acres of beets planted <laughs> for these sugar beets, 300 small factories all over France. <laughs> He invested so much also in storytelling, in marketing, so that people would be like, yeah, sugar beets, let's be sweet <laughs> internally and not support the slave trade, even though how much are you paying us, Napoleon? <laughs> so not that self-sufficiency is necessary, necessarily applaudable. It's still problematic on so many levels, but nonetheless, Napoleon's wars would end, sugarcane would become more accessible, and sugar beet to this day is the vast majority of sugar that we honestly eat. And of course, perhaps you don't know, GMO sugar beets are totally a thing. And unless you're buying organic sugar, you're probably mm, most assuredly buying GMO beet sugar 
Um, and unless it says cane sugar, it's most definitely coming from a beet rather than <laughs> a cane. So there's so much more to share and I'm so grateful to Napoleon <laughs> in some way. I never knew <laughs> and now I do. So now let's talk types of beets. There are lots of different types of beets. Um, and so basically they fall into two different departments. There's color and then there's size. So there's lots of different colors of beets. Of course, there's red and there's white, there's yellow, there's the beautiful Kyogia types with those beautiful stripes. And there's also oranges and all of these beautiful other colors. Our dear friend Solve is actually, was spent her PhD <laughs> at University of Wisconsin-Madison developing brand new varieties of beets with Erwin, Erwin Goldman who created Badger Flame Beet and experimenting with geosmin and colors. And so in the coming years, you will see some really exciting things that we will be sharing with you. Right now they are going to seed in our greenhouse, which is really exciting. And so that's kind of color. And then there are sizes, market classes of beets. So there are table beets, which you and I would think of when we think of beets, like, yes, that's a beet is a table beet. There are processing beets, which are often cylindrical. So imagine all of those cylinders that are pretty uniform in a can. Those are coming from selections of beets that are long, narrow sausages of beets. Um, and then there are mingles, which are just huge, often super sweet and often have tons of, they're, they're more like Swiss chard, as well as this beetroot, best of both worlds. And we have something that's somewhere in between. This Lutz green leaf is such a lusciously sweet, incredible beetroot, but Lutz green leaf, it's basically like having a Swiss chard plant on top of this beet. So you can sow it now and continue to be harvesting it all through, honestly, Thanksgiving here in zone five, if not longer, with a bit of season for season extension. So lots of different types of beets, so much beautiful diversity to savor. And we're grateful to share a few of those varieties with you. So now let's talk a few elements of garden planning. Here's a few things to keep in mind. Do you want to give your beets all the direct light that you possibly can? So as you're planning out your garden, definitely don't plan to tuck them in the shade of trees or of tomatoes, for example. And if you want to be succession sowing and harvesting beets all season long, yes. You can also plant a ton of beets right now and be harvesting them, thinning them as you go all season. Every few weeks we, we sow a new row of beets. And so generally it's that succession sowing that allows you to harvest beets consistently all season long. We'll talk more about succession sowing and when to sow very soon. Also, plan on thinning early and often. One of the most common things we hear with beets is that they just don't size, and there's a few reasons for those. Um, and often people are like, boron, yes, tell me about boron. I think I need more boron. We'll talk about boron, but mostly it's just thinning. So there's a whole thinning section to come, but plan actively on thinning. And then containers, you can totally grow beets in containers. Just make sure they're large and don't skimp on fertility. We'll talk about growing beets in containers soon too. And finally, if you're planning on growing them for the winter, plan on growing, sowing those beets about two months before final frost. So for us here in zone five, that's about early August. Early mid-August is what we're what we shoot for here at Fruition Seeds. So now let's talk sowing beets. It's direct sowing. We're in the full sun. We want well-drained soil. If your soil feels a little bit like soup, it's let it let it drain. Often in spring, if before it the soil gets really, really moist, pardon me, really, really warm any moisture that falls will not evaporate as quickly. So you want to be sure that soil is moist, but not soupy and nice and loose. Loose soil is not as crucial for beets as it is for something like carrot, but it always helps to loosen the soil before you sow them. So now let's talk about when. So we aim to sow seeds at the very earliest, about four weeks before final frost. Knowing that when is final frost? 
totally <laughs> a question that no one can answer. But it's anywhere here in zone five from mid-May to the beginning of June. So here we are generally toward the end of April is about one month before frost. And certainly we have found that if the daffodils are blooming, you can sow beet seeds and that they will germinate relatively quickly. Although let's talk because those days to germination, seeds germinate differently at different rates at different temperatures. So 17 days, it takes a beet seed to germinate at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> 17 days, almost three weeks, over two. So that's why, yes, you can plant them on the earlier side, but often waiting a little bit more so the soil can be that much more warm will just set you up for that much more success. Five days is the number of seed of days to germination at 77 degrees. So all seeds germinate on a bell curve. And so yes, but you can totally be sowing seeds of beets now, friends, and I hope that you do. And how deep to sow them? A scant half inch. As a general rule, you just sow seeds twice their depth. And you can sow them, I like to sow them in a row, in a trench. And I love to feed that soil first, whether it's with compost or a granular fertilizer. I love to sow that, so incorporate that fertility as I'm working and preparing that soil. But I also, you can also sprinkle in some of our organic granular fertilizer or compost into that trench and plant right into it. And then just be sure that you're tamping down the soil above that trench as you backfill it. So that seed, that beet seed has really excellent soil seed contact. And you can, if you're planting in rows, we, at least 18 inches between rows is crucial. We tend to go more like 24 inches, but honestly, it totally depends on you, your garden, and your system of what your paths look like. And you can sow them also in a grid. So not just a single line, a row of beets, but you can also plant them in a grid. Imagine a dice and like one, two, three, four, five, you can be planting them like that. And you can even be planting in, if they're not adjacent to each other, beets will actually grow out away from each other. So you can actually imagine my hands are two beets and another two beets. If they're all adjacent, but there's plenty of room around them, they will grow out rather than competing with each other. So planting in that grid strategy is a, often a really exceptional way to optimize every square inch of your garden. And especially if you're transplanting beets in little soil blocks, we'll talk about that soon. That's a, that grid style is a really excellent way to be planting your beets. So yes, let's talk about transplanting. So direct sow all of your roots, friends, please. As a general rule, root vegetables love to focus on their roots. <laughs> and so they love to grow where they're planted and disturbing the roots as you move them as transplanting can significantly stress out your root vegetables and thus they won't be in investing as much in their root vegetable that you will be enjoying. But that being said, you can transplant beets and admittedly we often do. And here's how. We transplant them in soil blocks. So soil blocks are these marvelous inventions that allow you to put soil in these and squeeze. It has a spring. You spring them out, plant the seeds into these. And natives, any, anything that is really sensitive and doesn't want to be transplanted, you will have a healthier seedling if you're growing them in a start, in a soil block. Take a look as without any kind of solid surface surrounding it, any of those roots naturally air prune and turn around, go the other way. They won't become root bound, but you can see this lovely little Napa cabbage 
so ready to go out tomorrow. I can't wait. This is the perfect size. There's one, there's two sets of true leaves. Here we go. And so if this was a beet though, this would be massively large for a beet transplant. I would put a single seed. We'll talk about multi-germs in a minute. And then from here, as soon as that, that seed germinates and those you can see all those cotyledons pop up. That's when you want to transplant it. Maybe a tiny bit larger, but if you see true leaves, you've waited too long. So let's talk true leaves for a moment. All seeds grow cotyledons before, not all seeds, most seeds, many garden seeds will grow cotyledon leaves, primordial leaves, if you will, rather than their true leaves, which comes second. So they emerge with these cotyledon leaves. This is what they look like in brassicas. So this leaf shape is exactly the same in this Napa cabbage and broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, radish, they all have that same formation. And they're all going to turn yellow and fall off. And that's just fine. <laughs> this, you see them yellowing, that's totally normal. It's like us losing our baby teeth and don't worry. So yes, now let's talk about multi-germs for just a minute before I say anything else that might be confusing. So seeds, beet seeds, as well as Swiss chard, they're the same genus species, they are multi-germ seeds, which means that they have multiple germination points within that single seed. It's kind of a strategy, and I hope you'll get to see beets going to seed on our farm one day, of the flowers being close to each other and fusing together as that seed grows. So they're basically aggregates of seeds together. So any given beet seed looks like a singular seed, and in fact, it is two to six seeds within that one single seed, which just makes it so crucial that we thin. And we'll talk about thinning in a minute, but that's where this soil block that you may be starting with your beets, you just want to plant one seed, not two, not three, <laughs> one seed, because that one seed definitely has at least two seeds inside, if not six. So if you have more than four seedlings coming out, you want to thin down to four. Those, when you plant out those four in a grid with at least six inches away from each other, um, they will be expanding beautifully away from each other, even though they're growing adjacent. And because you have them in a six inch grid, you they have plenty of space away from their brother and sister and kindred beet friends. So now let's talk about thinning because there's two different styles of thinning beets. One, as I love to practice beet thinning, is this. As soon, and in general, right, as soon as seeds leaves overlap, I thin plants out so that leaves are no longer overlapping. So that way, all of those remaining plants above the ground, they're not competing for light. Below the ground, they're not competing for nutrients. And so I love to eat as I go <laughs> through life, period. <laughs> so thinning, most so many people are really concerned about thinning and find it really challenging. And I can simultaneously totally sympathize and you're gonna eat your beets anyway, right? So eat your thinnings, it's delicious. So I love to eat those beet thinnings. I love beet greens almost as much as I love beet roots. And so as they're emerging, as soon as those cotyledons have emerged, that's when we're going in and early and often is an excellent mantra in the beet thinning department. As soon as those cotyledons emerge, we're going in and thinning them. Initially, it's like thinning microgreens, which microgreens are wonderful. And then as they're getting larger, you're thinning out and eating baby salad greens. And as they're getting larger, you're thinning out these golf ball size and then these larger and larger beets as you go. So it's a really wonderful way to have your beet and eat it too. <laughs> really consistent harvest of so lots of different sizes of beets and their greens um, for, you know, 
potentially months and all season long. So there's that strategy. There's also this strategy that is less of the munch, dabble, forage in your garden, be eating as you go, and is the more like efficient, this is what we did as like farmers, um, efficient market farmers. <laughs> this is our approach, which is also totally valid. As soon as those cotyledons emerge, and certainly as soon as you have any true leaves emerging, that is final call for so for thinning your beets so they're not going to be stressed and not creating beets for you as soon as you're seeing those cotyledons emerge and those first true leaves thin them to three inches between plants or four inches between plants that's what we generally go to for you know that's enough space so that all of your beets will be able to continue growing and sizing up nicely but if you really want small beets my mother loves small beets she just loves small vegetables and I love her so much. So if I'm growing her beets, we just thin to a couple inches for her. So they're nice and dainty, so quaint. But if we're sowing beets for our beet kraut, <laughs> this is our final half gallon of beet kraut, by the way. I'm very Polish. <laughs> so we have a 20 gallon crock full of you guessed it, sauerkraut that's with cabbage, but we also have another <laughs> crock that is just the same exact recipe, but with grated beets instead. So for those, I want grapefruit size beetroots, <laughs> and there's no reason to not do both of those things. So yes, if you want huge <laughs> like grapefruit size beets and you don't want to thin them in the interim, go ahead when you first see those cotyledons and first true leaves emerging, you can thin them. You can thin them to six inches between plants. And then you might mulch quite a bit because you're otherwise gonna be doing a lot of weeding in between. But there's as many ways to garden as there are gardeners. <laughs> so these are just two of the general watersheds, a watershed approaches to thinning beets. And again, because beets are that multi-germ, Oh, heavens, you just don't have a choice. <laughs> and it's delicious, whatever choice you make in the thinning department. So now let's talk about feeding your beets. So of course, there's first and foremost, always just feed the soil, not the crop, is one of the tenets of organic, sustainable, regenerative, fill in the blank of being a good ancestor in your garden. So rather than thinking, there are certainly ways we can feed our beets, but I also love to just remember that it's feeding that soil first and foremost and always. So especially, you know, just as you're working your soil this spring, go ahead and add compost, add, we have our organic granular fertilizers and different options. So go ahead and just say thank you, right? Give before you receive. And then beyond that, I love to just, you know, add a little bit of compost, a little bit of granular fertilizer right in that trench, right as we're planting. And then every two to three weeks after we've got a couple sets of true leaves, we are feeding with fish emulsion, dilute fish emulsion, everything on our farm. So two to three every two weeks is kind of a lot. I mean, it's not a lot in terms of what the plants can enjoy, but even if you just feed once a, once a year, it's better than zero. Even if you feed once a month, <laughs> it's way better than zero. And so if you can actually fathom make it happen every couple weeks, everything in your garden will be that much more delicious and abundant as well as disease resistant. So yes, we'll talk about disease resistance and beets very, very soon. So another thing to keep in mind um, in the feeding department is this thing called boron, this element um, called boron. And, you know, there are micro macronutrients, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and pay attention to this world a tiny bit, but honestly, there's so much that our ancestors learned and knew about gardens without knowing about those little and not so little things about the chemical realities of our biological, <laughs> bionutrient, geological cycling. And so don't get too concerned if it's totally not of interest. 
I know that there are those macro nutrients and then there are 100 plus micronutrients and boron is one of them and plants equally need micro and macro <laughs> micro and macronutrients and some of them need those things they all have different requirements for all of those things Beets are one of the few garden vegetables that actually love boron. Most garden vegetables, if you have a soil that doesn't have a lot of boron in it, they're not even going to notice. They're certainly not going to be affected negatively by it and surround you with less abundance as a result. Beets are an exception. So if you don't have boron in your soil, you totally have to add it. There's, you know, all kinds of recipes you can find online for essentially making borax into a garden amendment. But before you do anything, soil test first. And we have a wonderful blog about, you know, our guide to keeping soil testing simple. It's really fun and really easy, but it's like anything. My mother told me that about... <laughs> tying my shoes and I didn't quite believe her at first <laughs> so but like anything a few times later um, it becomes this amazing tool that you know I can tie my shoes maybe I can tie knots and then sail across the Atlantic Ocean why not so you never know where that love of soil testing will go but certainly if you are thinning your beets with exacting <laughs> timing and size and you're still not getting good beets. It could be, it's so rare, but it could, that could be a limiting factor. So, but first and foremost, get that soil test, which do it anyway. We do every year um, and I always recommend yearly, uh, but every other year is a solid kind of like minimum if you possibly, if, if you must not do it every year. And I love you and you'll have a beautiful garden either way. Let me not shame or stress you. <laughs> so now let's talk about beets in containers. You can totally grow beets in containers. Just make sure that the containers are fairly massive, <laughs> like 15 plus gallons, really quite large. And even though a smaller gallon size might look like a big container, containers are just small, a thimble of soil compared to the quality and quantity of soil of nutrients that plants have access to out in your garden. And so it's really important to bigger is better is a phrase I never use except for container gardening and to just not skimp in the fertility department, whether it's compost or slow release organic fertilizer, just be sure that you are really upping your game in your containers. And another nice thing about containers, there, there's generally a lot less weeding with beets, which is awesome. And the soil is often really loose to begin with, so they grow really well and are often harvested so easily. So yes, just make sure you've got great big containers and don't skimp on the fertility and you are good to go. Oh, a final thing in the container department. I always grow containers rather than rows. I plant them in that grid style with six inches between, you know, a, either a single seed if you're direct sowing them or a single little soil block transplant. Um, and oh, peat pots are also totally awesome or cow pots are a great option as well. I just highly recommend not using anything plastic lined like a cell tray or a six pack. So, oh my gosh, let's talk about insects and diseases. So insects, the main one that we have here in the Northeast that is going to munch your beets as much as you will, but hopefully not, is the leaf miner. And there are many different kinds, species of leaf miner that all manage to specialize in their preferential food groups. So there are brassica leaf miners, but the one that we have most predominantly here in the Northeast is the spinach leaf miner that loves spinach, but also beta vulgaris, so Swiss chard and beets. And leaf miners, they mine your leaves. They literally go in, they lay little white eggs at the base, of, at the bottom of your leaf, on the underside of your leaf. And you'll see them because they are laid in a cluster and they look like a little gauzy, almost like 
a little bit of cotton is stuck there on the underside of your leaf. If you see it, squish it. <laughs> and so that's the easiest way to control their populations. Once those leaf liner larvae hatch, then they find their way into your beautiful beet swishard <laughs> spinach leaf, and they proceed to mine out the palisade layer, that chlorophyll rich photosynthesizing part of your leaf. And they will just mine it. It will literally, they'll start to all, it'll kind of initially just start to look like little paths, little meandering um, paths throughout your leaf. But they also, if they're getting larger, they can actually, you can see like a whole section of your leaf will start to turn. Just you can see that outer epidermal, the transparent layer, and you can actually start to see the little larva inside. Ooh, squish them. If you see the eggs, if you see any of those, any signs, go ahead and squish. And especially if they're large, but even if they're small, don't do this. Just throw it on your compost pile bury it on your in your compost. You want to, you want them to die. That larva, if you just throw it on your compost pile, laying on top, it will just keep having its lunch and its dinner and breakfast the next day. So you want to be sure that you're actively thwarting its life cycle and killing it. Ugh. So I love to just harvest the beets. If I you know if they're young and hard, I hardly see them. I'm like, okay, just like, ugh, look the other way, put in plenty of garlic, olive oil, and lemon, <laughs> like we'll call it dinner. But you can also cut out around that part too. Um, and so by all means, eat those leaves, but by all means, do not just let that leaf margin just languish, sit on the top of your compost pile. Go ahead and bury it so that you can be confident that you are thwarting their life cycle. And so that is in the insect department. And um, diseases, let's talk. Cercopsora leaf spot is the predominant disease that beets get here in the Northeast. And they look like these little concentric dark rings. And they will be just here and there. As they start to grow, they can actually decrease the photosynthetic capacity of your leaf. But generally, Cercospora is actually just considered pretty cosmetic. Um, that's not going to reflect, reflect on, affect the flavor, the texture. You can totally harvest and enjoy those beet leaves. Um, and, but know that there's a few, diff, a few ways that you can prevent disease. And here, I'd love to just give you this list of how to generally prevent disease organically in gardens. And this applies to beets, Swiss chard, anything you've got. So here we go. First and foremost, plant a nutrient-dense soil. Don't skimp. Plants have immune systems, just like you and I. And in the same way that if I'm stressed, if I'm not sleeping, if where was dinner? <laughs> I might get hangry. <laughs> and certainly if, that, if I'm malnourished, my immune system is going to significantly um, be reduced. And plants are the exact same way. So yes, making sure whether it's in the ground with compost, adding slow release organic soil building fertilizer, or if it's just fertilizing with compost tea, with fish emulsion sprayed on your leaves, all of these ways are fabulous ways um, to make sure that your plants are really well fed and have a fabulously robust immune system. And from there, water the soil. Don't water your beet leaves or your tomato leaves or any leaves. Water the soil that you're hoping those roots of plants will imbibe. So that's a wonderful general notion. And especially here in the Northeast, if you can, because it's so humid at night, the less you can be adding humidity to your gardens in the evening, just go ahead and water in the morning. Early morning, the earlier the better, allows water to soak into the soil. But then in the day, all of that humidity will dissipate. And humidity, quick check in, water is the primary vector of every disease on the planet. So everything that you can do to both decrease leaf humidity and increase airflow around your leaves will just help 
every one of your plants be more resilient and less susceptible to diseases. And certainly there's crop rotation as well. So crop rotation is important because you know, roots like beets, shard, they have, they're going to be uptaking the same kinds of nutrients and that are a little similar, but different than tomatoes and potatoes and zinnias. So it's nice to rotate crops because then you're always giving, you're always feeding your soil, right? But um, the less that you can exactly take away exactly the same kinds of nutrients and then expect those same kinds of plants to grow and thrive, so much the better. Also, that allows, you know, whether it's insects, whether it's diseases, the more you rotate in your garden, the more, the less you'll have any of those diseases and insects just knocking on your door incessantly. So now let's talk about harvesting. Oh, I forgot to mention though, there are disease resistant varieties of beets as well. So if you're really concerned about certain things and take a look for your bioregion, because there are definitely more di <laughs> beet diseases um, that are significant. Um, and I'm really speaking to what we have here in the Northeast. So let's talk, yes, about harvesting beets. So my beets, you can actually grow as microgreens. So if you're harvesting microgreen beets, you're going to be harvesting anywhere from 18 to 25 days after you sow them. If you're sowing baby, if you're harvesting baby beets, like think a golf ball size or a little bit larger, that's like 35 to 40 days. And if you're harvesting full size beets, that's 55, 60 days or longer. Longer, beets will just continue to get larger and larger and larger. If they have not as many nutrients, they will stop growing. But if they have plenty of nutrients, they continue to uptake them and <laughs> put them into that delicious sweet starchy root. So that's another tip actually for container gardens. If you notice that your beets are there, and growing, but they're not growing as fast as you'd love them to, they're hungry. They will just keep growing as long as they have, the, the temperature is conducive for nutrient uptake and there are the nutrients to uptake. <laughs> so yes, hot little container tip interjection. <laughs> and now, so yes, you can enjoy beets at any size, golf ball to grapefruit and beyond, and it's totally up to you, friends. And another tip on harvesting beets, if your soil is loose, if your soil is moist, you might be able to just pull up that beet root by the leaves. But if there's any level of resistance, I highly recommend going in and loosening the soil with a fork or perhaps a trowel and just loosening it and then pulling them up in that way. And the most delicious leaves, cool, in case you're harvesting your beets wanting to enjoy your beet leaves as much as your beet roots, beet leaves are the sweetest and also will store the longest when you harvest in the morning. And friends, that's true also with lettuce, with mescaline mix, with kale, with anything else that you are planting that's just a leafy green. It is most sweet and also will store the longest harvested in the cool of the morning, especially if you harvest them and plunge them into cold water immediately and dry before tucking in your fridge. That is an excellent way to harvest even more nutrient dense and sweet and long storing leaves. So other things, if you're growing your beet for that marvelous beet root and you want the root itself to store, couple things to keep in mind. We harvest, we plant those beets two months before final frost. And so no matter where you are in the world, just two months before final frost, that is the key date. You, the larger the beet doesn't necessarily mean the longer that it will store. You want them to be about, you know, I mean, bigger than a tennis ball is best, but sometimes those larger beets, especially if they've been fed lots of nitrogen, they can have air gaps in them and they don't store as long. So yes, you don't want to, this two months before final frost is a really nice time frame. So they get large, but not too large. And then when you store them, leave the soil on. 
don't wash them until you're ready to enjoy them. So it's true, just unwashed and then trim back all of the leaves, literally as far back as you possibly can without leaving, without nicking the, the surface of the beet. You want that skin to remain nice and thick and strong and impervious to the outside world. Um, but so trim back all of those leaves as close to the beetroot as you can and tuck them in a plastic bag, close that plastic bag and they'll grow really well in your fridge. Some varieties are longer storing than others. And the this Lutz green leaf is not only a great big shard like beet and a delicious beetroot, but is also an excellent storage beet as well. So other things to keep in mind, let's talk about season extension in beets. So beets are cold hardy, which is why, you know, <laughs> don't send the half gallon of beet kraut flying across the kitchen, Petra. <laughs> so, <laughs> so beets are cold hardy. That's why we're planting them outside now. And that being said, they below 20, 25 degrees Fahrenheit, it's really too cold for them. And also in milder climates, you can overwinter them in the field. However, the voles are really ecstatic that you are harvesting them as well. And as I say that, I realize it, there's no other insects that I should have mentioned, but certainly voles are a very real predator of beets. <laughs> they love those sweet roots just like we do. And especially in the fall, as the world is starting to go dormant, they are starting to nosh often on your beet roots um, as well as you are. And sometimes they can beat you to it. So quick, just inter... <laughs> interloping moment for voles. This is how we control them on our farm. We take boxes, little boxes, and turn them upside down and put a little hole in the one side so that a vole can crawl in. And inside we have a trap. And just with some peanut butter or maybe something else tasty like a beet you don't want to eat, but <laughs> something tasty there. Um, right on that trap. And here's the thing, voles love the secrecy of darkness. And so the more you can kind of mimic that environment, the more you are attracting them. So that's where mulch is wonderful. And it just really, they love mulch. So yes, advantages are not always advantages. Disadvantages are not always disadvantages. So mulching, wonderful. You won't be, you'll be suppressing your weeds. You'll be retaining moisture. You will be <laughs> really helping your vole population thrive. So yes, those upside down boxes with a little hole, with a little, trap underneath is how we, right next to the beets that you don't want them to eat, is how to, um, one of the ways to organically control their populations. So now let's talk about season extension a little bit more, because although beets are cold hardy, if you want them to store, it's really important to not let them go deep into fall. You want that hard surface to not get fissured and cracked. And you'll see sometimes you can totally, we've harvested plenty of beets in November here in zone five. And if you look on the shoulders because the shoulders grow above the soil. The rest of the beet root is below the soil, but those shoulders of the beet are above. And same with carrots. If they are exposed to those freeze thaw, freeze thaw, those freezing temperatures that then Ex cause the water in those roots to expand, they literally will burst cells. And short term, it's not going to affect their flavor at all. They'll be totally delicious. Still harvest them, don't think twice, but just know that that freeze thaw, those frozen shoulders mean that they are not going to be able to store long into the winter. Um, so yeah, a floating row cover. Oh, I brought some to share. Floating row cover over your beets is a wonderful way to <laughs> protect them <laughs> from all manner of freezing temperatures. Um, it, although floating row cover is excellent for excluding certain kinds of insects, know that the leaf miners will thwart you in this department. So 
um, that's not great for that. Although you can put hoops and floating row cover over your beets in the spring, just so they have a little greenhouse. And that way, you know, they're gonna grow that much faster because the soil will warm and the air will be more consistently warm. So they will be that much warmer, that much larger, that much faster. So I would love to share now some common mistakes people make, and then I'd love to share with you a little story. So common mistakes people make sowing too early. So many people sow everything <laughs> too early. A raise of hands. We love you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's totally, and it's always a gamble, right? Some springs get so warm so fast. So you never know. But the cooler the soil is, the longer they'll take to germinate and the more you'll have to weed. And if it's too cold and too wet, they will likely just rot. So it's time for a shameless plug. If you don't already take notes, I'm not judging you either. <laughs> but if you would love to take note of all kinds of things, we have our across the season perpetual calendar. And perhaps you already know, but in case you don't, it's beautiful. And it has, instead of, it has one, two, three, four, five, all the days in April and every other month. And instead of Monday through Sunday, it has years. So you can see all of your notes and then see the patterns as they emerge across the seasons, which is why we call it across the seasons. And so that is a wonderful way to be tuning in and seeing patterns. I always think I'm going to remember brilliant things and I rarely do. So I love taking notes, leaving these little breadcrumbs for myself. And also it's just fun to see like last year on the 22nd of April, I found a robin's nest with three eggs inside with my three-year-old niece, Charlie. It was delightful. So we're recording all kinds of things. And at the end of this calendar, there's also our let's dig in section. So there's several pages of these where here's an entire section of notes on tomatoes. So if you just, instead of rifling through all of your details of everything in all, here, all juxtaposed, which is marvelous. Here's your go-to on tomatoes and of garlic and of beets. <laughs> I'll tip this over yet. <laughs> and yes, so take notes so that you can see when is too early, when is too late? How long does it take things to emerge? When I sewed on August 15th, did they actually size? All these wonderful ways that we can pay attention, which is one of the greatest gifts of our species. So next, in summer heat, drying out seeds in the as they're germinating is such a thing for people, for us too. And so just making sure that that seed bed is nice and moist, which is rarely an issue in the spring, but is often an issue in the summer. It's a really common mistake that people make because if that soil is dry and that seed germinates and then it's germinating and trying to grow into dry soil, it just, frizzles up and crisps, turns into a beet, a beet root, <laughs> crisp as can be a half millimeter long. So a tip with that, same with carrots, parsnips that take a lot longer to germinate than beets, you can take the same floating row cover. Instead of growing, throwing it over hoops, which create this little miniature greenhouse space, you can take a piece of this row cover and put it right on the ground as you're germinating those seeds and that will warm up the soil. It will also maintain moisture. And then when you're watering, if it's really dry, the water will hit this floating row cover before it hits the soil. And thus it will disperse all of that pressure and not displace any seeds. So this is a floating row cover is brilliant in so many ways. And Admittedly, we use floating row cover in a lot of different ways. When it's beautiful like this and not a single hole, <laughs> we use it for insect exclusion. And so, you know, no, no cabbage moth is going to lay eggs on our Brussels sprouts or our broccoli without with these 
with hole free fabric, but it's pretty thin. And so once it starts to get a few holes here and there, that's when we start to use it for season extension, just throwing it over lettuce, over beets, carrots, over all manner of things. And it still is going to retain plenty of heat, even though it has a few holes. And after it's getting even more raggedy after that, that's when we put it on the ground and just have it be that maintain, uh, maintaining a soil moisture for our germinating seeds. So other common mistakes, not thinning, not thinning early enough. Oh, it's so hard, but it's so delicious. I highly encourage you to find joy in your thinning practices. <laughs> and I am so here to help friends. And also washing roots before you store them. Another common mistake people make every year in the fall, we get lots of photographs of people emailing us saying, we've got all these beautiful beets, look at them. How do I store them for winter? And we're like, oh, well, you've already washed them. So just know if you want to actually be enjoying them all winter long, it's so crucial to not wash them first. And the other two more things in the common mistakes department, containers, just growing them in containers that are too small and also not continuing to feed them. If you notice once again that those beets are there but they're not getting bigger and you want them to get bigger, they're hungry. And final common mistake, not putting enough garlic in your pickled beet recipe. <laughs> That's all I got for you. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd love to just share this final little story with you friends and I hope that it lands for you in a way that feels good. It's one of my favorite remembrance, remembrances to share. So when I was 18 years old, I was in my grandmother's kitchen and we were we had just harvested tons of beets and we had a sink mound, mountains of beets and we were washing them. We were about to make pickled beets together. And my grandmother walked away and I had maybe a half hour by myself. And I know this is about to turn potentially a little creepy friends. I have never seen a ghost and I hope I never will, but I felt this hand on my shoulder from behind. And I knew instantly, pardon the tears in my eyes, that it was my grandmother's mother. And I knew that she was there with me in this beautiful way and letting me know in this extraordinary way that I was not the first person and neither was my grandmother in my family to have mountains of beets that we were cleaning and that we were putting up to then nourish our families and nourish our communities with. And it was so beautiful. And so I love remembering that because hey, it was just so beautiful. And also as I learn more about white supremacy and the privilege and power that I have as a white person, I love remembering my deeper roots, my Polish roots, roots that go back beyond even the political boundaries of Poland. For hundreds of years, people in my, that are in my blood and in my DNA have loved and grown beets and were not as taken with the imperialist colonial <laughs> paradigm that we now inhabit. And so I love every time I sow beets, I honor those ancestors, both in living memory and that memory of my great grandmother, Anna, who with her hand on my shoulder and all of those ancestors in such deep time who knew how to grow and how to sow and save seeds and to grow culture and community that the world and that they could be proud of. So I encourage you also to sow seeds, not just for yourselves, but for people you love and to give thanks for our ancestors, all the things that we have learned and all of the trials we have all survived somehow <laughs> and have so much hope. Every seed planted is this radical act of placing our hope in the darkness that we might all find our way to the light again. 
So thank you, friends. Another quick quote from Margaret Mead to round out our evening. <laughs> Never doubt that a small committed group of citizens is the only that can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that has. And I think if Margaret were here with us tonight, she would say a small committed group of <laughs> gardeners <laughs> wanting to grow beets better, knowing they can is <laughs> not the only way, but certainly a phenomenal way to change the world. Oh, and grow some beets in the meantime. So thank you for joining me, friends. Thank you, Kira, for sharing your joy of language justice. And thank you all. Thank you, Matthew, for hanging out in the chat <laughs> and accompanying us all in all of our questions and quandaries. And thank you all for joining us live. It is such a beautiful spring evening. I don't take for granted that you're here. It is so special. And thank you to everyone listening to this after the fact. We love you too, and hope to see you all on the farm one day. If you wouldn't mind, come off mute and say good night to each other. And I can't wait for next time, friends. <laughs> good night to each good other. Night. Good, night. good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Good